Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is the truth. We receive it this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you for all you're bringing forth through that wor the word in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Begun sharing with you this morning on the subject of salvation. God wants us to understand about salvation. We see in Jude 1 verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. The common salvation was available for everybody, not just for certain people. God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We saw the fact as we looked at these words and we talked about this morning that the word salvation, we look it up in the Greek and you look it up in the Hebrew, it comes down to the fact that it means to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, to be protected, to be preserved, to be prospered, to be made whole, to be free, to be safe, to, be, to come to the place where you do well even in life. He prospers you. He blesses you. God wants His salvation to come forth in our life. We talked about the fact that God is the Savior. Remember, after the fall of man, man, the only chance for him to get back into relationship with God was through redemption. Well, man couldn't redeem himself. He was under, under Satan's dominion already. So it was God who had to accomplish the redemption. And we looked at the scriptures this morning where we saw that he was spoken of as the Savior and the Redeemer. The Redeemer who would come and redeem us, who also would be the Savior of the world. We saw how Jesus came and he saved us from our sins. We saw the fact that he is the one who now is what everyone must receive in order to get born again, come back into relationship to get a brand new spirit. We saw that he's the savior of the world, also the savior of all men. Anybody who teaches out there that's saying that only certain ones are to be saved is a lie, it is a lying teaching. 1 Timothy 4.10, therefore we both suffer and labor and suffer labor and suffer reproach because we trust the living God who is the Savior of all men. He is the Savior of everyone. He wants everybody to be saved. We saw out of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved, not just a select few. These people are totally, totally deceived that are teaching that there's only a certain select ones. All are to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. We also saw the fact that he comes to not only save all men, but he also comes to bring forth a remnant that is going to be raised up in these last days. We see that there's also household salvation. We talked about household salvation and household punishment curses that would come. God views the whole household. And even when one would sin, a, whole, a punishment would come upon the whole household. We saw many scriptures about that from God's standpoint, how he views the household. He wants us to see whole households, of course, come to the Lord. We talked about what gets saved. We pointed out the fact that when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, we get a new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. We're a new creation. We're born again. So the spirit has to get changed. We get a new spirit, the spirit of Christ. But salvation is more than just getting a new spirit. And that's the way people approach it out there a lot of times. Just get a new spirit, you got your ticket to heaven, everything's fine, doesn't matter what you do from then on. Not so. Salvation is more than just getting a brand new spirit. It also involves our soul and our body. We saw the fact that God is the one who comes to restore our soul and to heal it. And he's the one who will come to bring healing to our physical body. This is all a part of what salvation is all about. He is the healer, he is the deliverer, and he wants you to get set free. And we looked at many things, of things that it's, the Word speaks about what we are saved from. Tonight we're going to continue on this, and we see scriptures now about how we are saved. How is the salvation going to come forth? In John chapter 10, we see over in verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. We talked about there's no other way to be saved except through Jesus. He is the Savior of all men. He is the door. When you receive Jesus, if you will enter in, if you might enter in, then you will be saved. and You can be in fellowship with him and walk in the ways of the Lord. We also know 
but it is from the preaching of the Word of God. God's Word is full of power. When you share the Word with people, that Word's going into their heart and mind, and the power of God is at work to bring them to the place of repentance that they would receive the Lord. We see in Acts chapter 11, verse 14, where Peter was rehearsing to the people in, at Jerusalem what had happened at Cornelius', Cornelius house. And he says what he did there. He says, Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Words. The Word of God. That's why you need to be able to explain and give the Scriptures, and give people the Word of God, showing them exactly what the Word says, and get it sown in their heart, so that they will come to the place of understanding what they need. The Holy Spirit will open their eyes of their understanding, and the power of God will work to bring them to the place of repentance to receive Jesus. He says in Acts 13, 26, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Notice, the salvation comes through the word. The word of this salvation is sent to us. That's why, again, when you're talking to people, don't give them your opinions. Give them the word of God. You don't even necessarily give them your testimony. You give a little bit about what God's done for you. But primarily, you want to give the Word because that's what God uses to convict them and bring them to the place of repentance that they would receive Jesus. You need to be able to explain clearly God's, the, how the people can be redeemed and how they receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Same time, people need to hear the Word. And they need to hear the Word for themselves. We see in John chapter 4, in verse 42, this is where he said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of I say, and remember the woman that Jesus had read, her, read the mail on her and told her all the things that she was doing, and she went out and told the whole city, you know, all the things, this has got to be the Christ. Well, he says, Now we believe, not because of your saying, but we have heard him ourselves. People need to hear the word of God themselves. They can't ride on somebody else's faith. They need to get faith themselves through the Word of God and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's why you've always got to get the Word to people. That's the most important thing to sow in their heart. And what happens when we receive this? How we are saved is through spiritual birth. We see in Titus 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Now, the washing is this word lutron. We talked about this before, that there is a washing, but there's also a word which refers to a bathing, the whole person, the bathing. And this is the word for bathing, the bathing of regeneration. This word means new birth. A new birth, bathing, bathing of the new birth where we get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. So every one of us need to get receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, get him born again. Through this bathing of the new birth, they get a brand new spirit on the inside of them. And we talked about, and just bring it up again this morning, we talked about the fact that the Jews should have known about this. They already knew what the Word said, and they had studied the Word. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. They knew that there was the prophecy of a new spirit coming forth. They needed a new spirit because of the fall of mankind. And so what happens when a person receives Jesus as personal Lord and Savior? They become a new creation. How? In spirit. They get a new spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The word creature actually means a creation, a new creation, brand new on the inside of them. The old spirit is gone, brand new spirit comes into them. And remember, what do they get? They get the spirit of Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, verse 6, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. They get the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Then, of course, you go on to lead them to receive the Holy Spirit. So, we, another thing we see back on Titus, talking about how we are saved. It is the mercy of God that brings us forth. Notice he said it's according to his mercy. The mercy is the love of God in action toward us. God, 
He so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die for us in order to show that we could then come into relationship with him by receiving Jesus. It was his mercy extended toward us in order to bring forth salvation, praise God. And also, this salvation here by the washing or the, the bathing of the new birth, but also the renewing of the Holy Spirit. There's a further, as we talked about, how the salvation of the Lord is not just getting a new spirit, it's also in the soulish realm. And especially, what do we need? We need our minds renewed. We need ourselves being renewed by the Holy Spirit. And this renewing is a renewal, a renovation, a complete change. And how does this happen? Well, this word that we see here is the same word used over in Romans chapter 12, and verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2, where it says, We're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing. Same word. The renewal, renovation, complete change of our mind. That's why it's imperative that you get the word in you, and as you're ministering to others to help them to become disciples, you get the word into them. They need to hear the word. And it's going to be little by little process as you sow the word in them to come to the place of belief and having faith so that they'll act upon the word in their life. So salvation of the Lord in the soulless realm is going to come through the word as the word is being sown in us. And we know that we saw the scripture this morning, but look at it again, James 1.21, where, where it says, Receive with meekness the engrafted word. Engrafted means implanted. It's implanted. It's not only implanted in your heart, but it's also implanted in your mind, which is able, has the power to save your souls. It'll bring a change in the soulless realm through the word coming into the area of your mind. God wants our mind renewed, so we have the word of God in us. That produces then the work of the salvation of the Lord continuing on in our life. It's also by the grace of God. We see over in Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, the Bible says. That's his favor to all men. And what did it do? It brought salvation to us. We see over in Ephesians, it speaks to the fact Ephesians chapter 2, picking up in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, you have quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Now, to show you what this really means, by grace, you are, that's the main verb. And then, saved is not part of the main verb. This is the, this is the main verb, the indicative mood. And the word saved is a different word. It is actually a participle, which is, would be translated, having been saved. So it says, by grace you are. Everything that you are comes from God, the favor of God in your life through the word, through his working. By grace you are, having been saved. You get saved, and then you are everything by his grace. That's literally what it says. And he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God wants us always to realize the great riches of his grace, his favor towards us is always available. He says in the ages to come how he will show these exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards you and towards me. And it's all coming through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved, here again, through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. So, it comes through faith. Your faith is going to receive the salvation of the Lord, whether it's getting born again, or whether it's receiving the Holy Spirit, or whether it's receiving some promise from God, all the things that He accomplishes. It says here, it's the gift of God that comes from Him. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we know, unfortunately, there have been people out here that say, well, you're saved through faith, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works. And they, what they come up to is saying, well, you're saved by faith alone, by faith only. Well, we already saw that that is not true because you're not only saved, but with your faith, it doesn't say faith only, does it? No. 
it just says not of works, talking about human works, man's works, of just thinking that he can merit something just because of the things that he does. But we've already seen, and we'll take you to this, that there's another aspect of how the salvation comes, and this is through our works, but these are not works of the flesh or works of man. These are through the works of faith. We see when it talks about in James chapter 2, verse 17, Even so faith, if it, talking about faith, has not works, it's dead, being alone. In other words, faith will not produce anything unless faith has works. What kind of works? Works of faith. Working your faith, doing the things that God says. He says, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show thee my faith by my works. Your faith is shown to God by your works, by your actions, the things you do, what you're acting upon, what you're speaking, all the things that are going forth out of you as you're acting on the word. He comes down to verse 20. Wilt thou know, O vain man, or devoid of truth this means, man, Faith without works is dead. Again, the teaching that says that we are saved by faith only, or faith alone, is a lie. We must have faith, but we also must have works of faith in order to see promises come to pass. Was not Abraham our father justified by works, or declared righteous by works? That's right. But remember, we already have seen, we talked about the works series, how that it was accounted unto Abraham as righteousness because he believed in God. He believed. So his faith counted him as righteous, but also here now, he was also declared righteous by his works when he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Seeing thou faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect or came to completion to accomplish the things that God wants. And then we come down to verse 24. See then how that by works a man is justified or declared righteous, and not by faith only. This verse destroys the teaching in most of the Christian world out there because they all, most all teach you are saved by faith alone or faith only. Well, the scripture says you are by works a man is justified or declared righteous, and not by faith only. So our works of faith are important. And we see this in the area of working out our salvation. Over in Philippians, chapter 2, verse 12. So you get born again. That's the doorway in. That's just the beginning. Then you begin to get the Word in you. And you begin to your mind renewed. And then you begin to do the Word. Start walking in line with the Word. Walking by faith. And what are we going to do? Philippians 2, 12 talks about us working out our own salvation. It says, now, you can't do it in your own strength or your own ability or your own good works apart from the Word of God. How do we work out the own, our salvation? It means you and, I, you and I have a part to play in it. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, that's the key, obedience, obedience to God. Remember, we talked about how sin has no dominion over you, and if you yield your members unto obedience, it produces righteousness fruits of righteousness in your life. And the righteous are the ones who are saved. So as we have obedience, always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. It means every one of us, we have a responsibility to work out our own salvation by always obeying the Word of God. When it talks about this working out here, this particular word, this is present tense. It shows that it's an ongoing action. This is not just something that happened when you were born again and then that was it. No, it's an ongoing work of working out your salvation. And it's an imperative mood, which means it is a command unto you and to me. You and I are all, to work, every one of us are all, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And he goes on and he says, It's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. So God wants us to be understanding that as you obey the word of God, you are working out your salvation because salvation is more than just being born again. You also are going to, how you're going to be saved is going to be through the power of God. The power of God is resident in the word. It's like seed. You have seed, you plant it in the ground, now it begins to work and start to produce the plant or the tree. 
The word that you have is like seed. You get the word in your heart, now it begins to work. The power is within it. It begins to work when it gets in that place where it can work, which is in your heart, to bring forth the, the promises of God. In Romans 1.15, Paul says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Ro Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is the power of God. It's the power of God. And what will it produce? It will produce the salvation of the Lord. And remember, we talked about salvation. It just, just When you see the word salvation, don't just think it's going to produce the new birth. It talks about this word meaning deliverance, preservation, safety, deliverance from enemies, and any kind of things. Uh, it really, it's talking about healing as well, all these different things. Every, every promise, if you really study this out, this particular word means healing as well as deliverance, as well as peace, preservation, deliverance from your enemies, things that come against you. The Word of God is the power of God unto salvation. That's why getting the Word in you puts the power of God in you. It'll produce the salvation of the Lord. And then as you obey it and do it, it goes into operation to bring things forth in your life. God wants us to understand that the power of God is the way He's going to do things. He's a God of power. We see over in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are, sa which are saved, it's the power of God. Again, God does everything by power, His power of His Word. And you and I are to live by the power of God. That's the way you're going to live at all times as you walk in His ways. We also see over in 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved through the gospel. It produced the salvation of the Lord, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. That shows the fact that the words that he proclaimed, that we're to hold fast to these, this word keep in memory here, really means to hold fast. You're to hold, hold on to something, hold fast to it, as Young's brings out. Hold fast to it, take hold of it, do it, put it in operation in your life and it will produce the salvation of the Lord. We also see that how salvation comes, it says, through the foolishness of preaching. You think God wouldn't have to, you know, just, just tell you the truth and just in the Word and you just grab hold of it. It talks about the foolishness of preaching in order to preach into people's heart, sowing the Word in them. After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The preaching of the gospel brings the power of God into a person to bring them to the place of receiving Jesus. We also see that the salvation of the Lord comes through the life of Jesus. And the life is in His Word, and it will be manifest in us. His life will be manifest in us through the Word of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. His life, the Zoe, life of God, that is in the Word of God. The Word of life will bring things forth. In fact, what's Jesus referred to? What is He? The Bible talks about. In John 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was God. He is the Word. And then we see over in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and our hands have touched, of the Word of life. Jesus is the Word of life. It brings the life of God into you. And remember, God's Word, it's not only spiritual law, but it's also spirit and life. John chapter 6, down in verse 63, speaks of this. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. That's why we don't walk in the flesh. We crucify the flesh. We put off all the things of the flesh. The words that I speak unto you, they're spirit, and what else are they? They're life. God's Word has life in it. It will bring things forth. It will bring the forth the things that God purposes to come forth in your life. Also, we see the Bible says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that we are saved through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brought us into the new birth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. 
That's how we came into the body of Christ and we got born again. So the spiritual salvation occurred by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now there's also a baptism of water and it does have an element of salvation in it. 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse 21 it says the like figure whereunto even baptism, talking about water baptism, doth also now save us, and then it qualifies this, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, it didn't get rid of the sins, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That now you're giving an answer to him of the good conscience, the fact that you have been born again. It's revealing what has already happened on the inside of you, and it's a public declaration to the world that you are through with the world, you are following Jesus, you've come into the priesthood, now you belong to him, and so, it has an element of the salvation, the fact that you are saved from the world. You are now saved from all these things that, that you have been delivered out of through Jesus Christ. And you give an answer of a good conscience towards God. Another thing that we see of how salvation comes to us, we see over in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20, over in verse 4. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you, to deliver you, to liberate you, to set you free from whatever bondages might come at you. God's the one who fights. As you put your faith in operation and fight the good fight of faith and war good warfare, your faith is going to conquer the enemies. And how do you, what are you doing? You're putting God in operation. He will fight for you against your enemies. And what will he do? He's going to save you. He's going to deliver you. He's going to set you free from all the bondages in your life. <clears throat> we see over in the Psalms, talking also about how he brings his salvation, how he does these things in your life. Psalm 17, in verse 7, he says, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them that put their trust in thee. Right hand is a symbol of authority and power. He saves us through his authority and his power that he manifests mightily. He is a God of power, a God of might. He's given us the authority. He's given us the power of God. And he's going to manifest himself. It's going to be with his saving strength. The strength of God is going to manifest. We see in Psalms 20, verse 6, Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand saving strength or might of his right hand. God is a God of power. And he manifests that we have authority, the power of God in his word, the might of God, the spirit of might is to be operating in us. That's how you're going to, you're going to have to use spiritual power to conquer enemies. It's not just pray and look, what, see whatever God's going to do. No, the power of God, the might of God is going to come into you. You've been given the authority. You're going to speak the word. You're going to war the warfare. You're going to conquer the enemies in your life. Over in Psalms 28, verse 8, the Lord is their strength. He's the saving strength of his anointed. You have the anointing in you, the anointing from the Spirit of Christ, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That anointing will break every yoke of bondage, as the Bible says, and you are going to do the mighty works of the Lord through the saving strength of the anointing, the Holy Spirit anointing working in your life. We also see God's working in your life as you allow him to work. And how does he work? Through the Word. He didn't work independently of the Word. The Word you're hearing and doing is the way He works. You hear His Word and do His Word, He's working, bringing forth what He purposes. That's why people that don't spend much time on the Word, they don't see God working too much in their life because that, He is the Word and that's the way He is going to work in them. And people that might hear the Word, but if they don't do the Word and act on it, they won't see Him working in their, His life. Psalms 24, 74, Psalm 74, verse 12. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. He is working salvation. He's working it in your life. You have a part to play because you're going to work it out, remember, because you're always obeying, putting him in operation in your life, in everything that you do. And there is the way of salvation. Jesus is the way. We pointed this out this morning, but we'll point it out again this evening. In Acts chapter 16, we see verse 16. Here, 
came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. This is an evil spirit. Divination was a python, python spirit. Met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. A spirit of witchcraft was operating. What was the spirit doing? The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now that doesn't look like a bad statement to make. They're servants of the Most High God. They're showing us the way of salvation. Sounds like a pretty good thing. Well, Paul said, this she did many days. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Now, why was it? What was wrong? Well, the translation is not right. That's the problem. You don't see what's being said correctly. When you have a word, the, right here, there is a definite article in the Greek that ha that's always there when it's translated the. If the definite article is not there, then you translate it a. In this case, in the Greek, there is no definite article here. They should never have translated it in the King James the way. It's not there. I put the cursor over it, there's nothing comes up. Young's corrects the error. A way of salvation is what the Greek says. Now that changes the whole thing. These, are, these men are servants of the Most High God that show unto us a way of salvation. Otherwise, not acknowledging that there's only one way, but just saying that it's a way, but my way is in a way too, and anybody else's way. And we see that same lie coming forth today. You see it in modern times. There's many paths to God, many ways that you can be saved. You know, you got your religion, I got mine, everybody's got theirs and always gets them to God. It's all a lie. There's only one way, only one Savior, only one person who accomplished the redemption, Jesus. There is no other way. There isn't a way. Of course, this is why he got grieved about it and he cast the spirit out and got rid of it. God wants us to understand that there's only one way. It's Jesus and he is the word. So we've seen many things about how we're saved, but the next thing we want to talk about is seeing that salvation is a process and it's also conditional. It is a process ongoing work in your life, and it's conditional. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It says, but unto us which are saved, you think it's just talking about someone that's already saved, when you read it as are saved, it's the power of God. Is that the correct translation? No. It's poor because it's making you think that it's already accomplished thing. You already are saved. No. What this says is, literally, it's a present tense participle. Present tense means ongoing action. A participle will be translated having been or the something being something with a present tense. It's a passive voice showing that this is being accomplished by somebody else, which is God in us, as you and I are walking in line with his ways. Literally, the way you would translate this present passive participle says, Buntu, unto us which are being saved, or as Young's brings out, those being saved. Though the, those who ha, are being saved. That's the way it should be. Well, that tells you something. It's not like it's already been done. This makes you think it's our saved that's already done. No, it's our being saved, showing that salvation is a process, it is an ongoing work in your life producing the whole, all the salvation that God w brings. It's not just getting a new spirit and then that's it. No, but that's just the beginning of the work when you're born again. Unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. There's a process of being saved by the word, and the power of God. We see another place over in 1 Corinthians. <coughs> Chapter one, 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and also, and, and wherein you stand. Then he says, by which also you are saved. Sounds like it's a past tense statement already accomplished. Again, we put the word, ver, verb of, cursor over this verb. You'll find that this, again, is a present tense. Present tense verb, which means... Again, 
It's showing the process. Passive voice, showing that something that God is doing on, a, on an ongoing basis in our life. The way you would translate this, by which also you are being saved. Not that it's already done. See, if this was a past tense verb, it'd have to be aorist or it'd have to be um, perfect tense that it's already been accomplished. But it's not. It's a present tense. And um, they've missed the whole thing. And so it says, by which also you are being saved. And then it says, if. Now it tells about conditions. This is an ongoing process. But now it even says, this is the way this, it's not automatic just because you heard the word. Now there's more condition for this. If you keep in memory, which means to retain. If you retain, you hold fast, as Young's brings forth. You retain what I preached unto you. Otherwise, you've got to hold on to what's been given unto you. What happens when the word comes? The devil also comes to take the word out of your heart. Stop it from working, right? Lest you believe and be saved. And produce the result in your life. So you've got to guard yourself that the devil does not take the word out of you. Because if the word gets taken out of you, will it produce the salvation or the blessing and the promise? No, it won't. So by which you are being saved if that's a condition. So we see from this, it's an ongoing work, but it's also got a condition to it. If you are retaining or holding fast what I preached unto you, if you retain it and hold fast to it, that means you've incorporated it into your lifestyle. The devil didn't take the word out of you. You're a doer of it. You're walking in the light of it. He says, unless you have believed in vain. Otherwise, it di didn't produce. It didn't bring forth. See, many people get the word sown in their heart, but the devil comes and takes it out because they don't do it, and they don't see any fruit. They don't see the results. They don't see the salvation of the Lord working in their life to bring forth a promise because they did not meet the conditions. You and I must meet the conditions of the things that he tells us that we're to do. We see another thing, again, showing this ongoing action. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, over in verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved. Sounds like it's a past tense, already a done deal, doesn't it? Well, let's put the cursor over and see if we see an aorist tense or a perfect tense. Nope. Again, a present tense passive participle. They did a very poor job of translating things correctly. Makes you think it's already accomplished in fact, are saved, it's already done. No wonder people haven't figured things out because they have not looked up things in the Greek. In them that are being saved, as Young's brings forth, those that are being saved, and it's interesting when it talks about here about those that are perishing or be, are destroyed. That doesn't mean they're already destroyed. People that aren't, you know, are the people that aren't walking in line with the word, are they already destroyed? No. But what's happening if they're not walking in line with the word? The devil's working in their life. Well, present tense. They are being perished or being destroyed or being lost. But this word really means to be destroyed. They are being destroyed in some aspect. This is why the word in you is so important. You are either being saved through the word or you could be being destroyed or see some kind of destructive work through the enemy working in your life if we're not doing the word. That's why it's imperative that we guard our heart, we choose the way of the word, we do what the word says so we can see God continually work his work in our life. And that is so important. We also see over in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Where verse 46 talks about how with one accord they were continuing daily in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, eat their meat with gladness, singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Well, that makes you think, you mean there's only certain ones that should be saved? The guy that should be saved today? Again, this is not the way it should be. Present, passive, participle, adding to the church daily such as are being saved, not should be saved, it just totally has a different meaning, are being saved. Again, the work is going on continually, 
God wants the salvation to be working in, in, as we're seeing people come to the Lord, but also in the church, He's doing a work in us and is continually producing salvation in all of our lives. This is an ongoing process. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. See, if you look at the, these versions that, where they haven't translated them right, no wonder we have so much error out there in the body of Christ because they haven't learned to look at the Greek and to study these things out. Or they've ignored it, one or the other. 1 Peter 4, verse 17 says, The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment is going to come to the church before it comes to the world. If it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And what's this talking about? First of all, it's talking about the ones that are not obeying, ongoing, the gospel of God. Remember, this is coming to the church. Oh, now we're talking about Christians. We're not talking about the world. We're talking about the Christians that are not obeying the word of God continuously. That means they must be obeying something else. They're either walking the way of the world, the flesh, or doing whatever they want and not doing the word of God. Hey, you're going to be in trouble. Judgment's going to come. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, again, sounds like past tense, doesn't it? Well, let's take a look and see. Is this a past tense? No. Same thing. Present tense, passive voice, indicative mood. How it, the, it says, if the righteous scarcely are being saved, the ongoing process has happened, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? <laughs> well, they're through for sure. God expects us to continually obey His Word and to be righteous. Remember who are the righteous. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're perfectly righteous forever. You have a spirit that's righteous, but righteousness is more than just being born again, remember. In fact, we'll come back here in a second. What does the Bible say? 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. It's not just, getting, not just getting a new spirit and being born again, and that's all there is to it. As so many people teach out there in the church world today, they teach when you're born again, you're perfectly righteous. It is a lying teaching. It's a present tense. He that is doing, as Young's brings out the the verb tense when he says is doing that's the way it should be translated he that is doing continuously righteousness is righteous so when we talk about the righteous this is the guy who's doing the word of god consistently but it's also interesting what it says here back in first peter chapter 4 and verse 17 or verse 18 where it said if the righteous scarcely be saved what's this scarcely all about this is a particular word mollus which means with difficulty and not easily. With difficulty and not easily. That means it's not a cakewalk. It's not a picnic. Why? Because the devil will attack you, pressing you, trying to get the word out of you, trying to stop you, trying to hinder you every step of the way. You gotta be ready to resist the devil. You submit to God, you resist the devil with the word of God, you got to have the armor of God on so you can stand against all the wiles, all the tricks, strategies, everything that the enemy would bring against us. So the righteous, with difficulty and not easily, are being saved. That's what it literally says. And the key is going to be obedience. If you're not obeying the gospel of God, is the power of God working on your behalf? Are you going to conquer the enemy? No, you're going to give place to the enemy left and right. Obedience. See, the devil doesn't want you to obey the gospel. He, he, it's okay if you know some of these things. You can have faith, but remember, your faith's dead unless you're working it. He just doesn't want you to do it. Make sure you're not doing the word. So he's going to try to do everything possible to try to not get you to obey or be righteous, truly righteous, by doing the word of righteousness so that you will see the salvation of the Lord working in your life. God wants us to be those who are doing what he says, seeing this work. It's a process, see. Revelation 21, verse 24. The nations of them which are saved 
Well, we've seen that many times, haven't we? You know what we have to do. We've got to check out every one. You can't trust anything. Well, maybe this one's a past tense one. Nope. Same thing. Present passive participle. What's that tell you? Nations are being saved as well if they walk in the ways of the word. You know, the nations that forget the word of God, they're going to be turned into hell. The Bible talks about they forget God. But the nations that make their laws according to God's ways, or the righteous ones, are going to enter in. See? The nations of them which are being saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. That's why we've got to have leaders that put the word of God in first place and submit to the word. And that's the way we walk. God's got a lot of work to do to bring that forth in our nation, get all these ungodly ones out and get the gospel. That's why the body of Christ has got to rise up and pray and get the word out, start preaching, and start reaching people to see them get born again. It's absolutely imperative to see this be accomplished. So here again, we've seen all these scriptures, present tense, are being saved. What's that tell you? Salvation is a process, an ongoing work, and also we see that it is also conditional. We see another place. Over in John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power or the right or the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, when you talk about believe, we're going to see scriptures here about belief. This again is the present tense, actively believing continually on his name. Otherwise, if you're believing one minute and then you go back in unbelief or something, are you now in, the, in this situation? No. It's the one who's continually believing on his name. Ongoing. It's not just get my ticket for a moment to heaven and then go and waltz around and do whatever I want in the ways of the world and the flesh and do all these things that so many people teach out there. It's a lie. Now, some of the people even say, well, all your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. You're in great shape. What a lie. People are so totally deceived by this. Not so. To them that are believing, to those believing continuously in his name. Over in Acts chapter 15. So you see that salvation is an ongoing work. Verse 11. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. When we see, first of all, this word believe, we look under this, this one. This is present tense. The guy who is continually believing, we are believing continually, that the, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says here about how we shall be saved. Well, if it shall be saved, that would be a future tense, wouldn't it? <laughs> there are any future tense there. What it's saying is, we believing that through the grace of God, of, of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's an infinitive, you see that's an infinitive there, how do you translate infinitive? To, to be saved, even as they. In other words, this is saying that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are continually believing to be saved because the work of believing on the Word and doing it produces the salvation of the Lord. Young brings this out somewhat by we believe to be saved, or more literally, we are believing the Word to be saved, because as you're believing the Word and doing what He says, the grace of God is working. And what is it doing? It's producing the salvation. Remember we saw that where it said, by grace you are, having been saved, you're everything by the grace of God, have from the result of the Word of God in your life. We also go back over this one over in Romans that we looked at. Romans 1, verse 15. So much as in me is, says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, or again, Present tense, that is believing continually. Otherwise, if you're not believing the Word, now what's evidence that you believe something? You're going to be doing it. You're going to do it. You're going to show your faith by your works, remember. If you, you know, that's how, how, do you, how do you show anybody your faith? By your works, by your action. If you're continually believing, then it means you're doing what it says, walking it out. That produces the power of God in your life, and it's going to produce the salvation of the Lord. 
We also see it in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Makes you think, I just have to believe for a moment and everything's fine. No, present tense again. Again, we're taking the time to show you this, that we're just not pulling one little place where it's a present tense out. They're all present tense, aren't they? The whole thing means this is an ongoing continuousness, and if you don't meet those conditions, then are you going to see the saving, the salvation of the Lord? No. To save those who are believing, those believing continuously. It is an ongoing work. Salvation is a process in your life. There's also other scriptures that are important that we need to look at. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. He says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time that we should let them slip. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How are we going to, we, this, 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 this been, it first began to be spoken, by the Lord and was confirmed in us by them that heard him. So here he's talking about if we neglect the salvation that was spoken, begun to be spoken, and it was continually being spoken, it's continually being spoken in our life, it's a present tense, through the word of God coming to us. And so if, if we neglect this great salvation, by what? By not doing what he says. Are we going to see the promises of God come to pass? No. Not at all. And when he talks about how we ought, this is actually the word die, which means necessary as binding. It's a covenant word, and it really means must. It's translated must 58 times. And this is not just that I must at one moment in time. This is a present tense. I continually must, ongoing action, give more earnest heed to the things that I've heard. Otherwise, everything that I've heard on an ongoing basis, I must give earnest heed to take that word and put it in operation, do what it says in my life, and not let it slip. Otherwise, God doesn't want anything slipping. And I wonder how many things that we've heard over the past have slipped because we didn't do them. We didn't walk in them. And, oh, I forgot all about that. I didn't know about that, or I didn't do, do what the word said on that area. We don't want to let, us, let anything slip, as he says. Because what happened, the word spoken, every transgression, disobedience received a just recompense of reward, you know. God's word is so. You're either going to be blessed or if you don't do it, you know, you're not going to see the blessings and you, don't, you do contrary, you're going to see the curses. That's why we're not going to escape if we neglect the great salvation. God is expecting us to take hold of his word and to do what his word says consistently. Also, we see over in Hebrews, well, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he were a son, talking about Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? Unto all them that obey him. It's just the guy just obeyed him once and received him as their personal Lord and Savior, and that was it? Nope. Present tense, those who are continually obeying him. So he's the author of eternal salvation. It's going to last forever. If you continually obey the Lord, you continually have eternal salvation. If you don't, are you going to continually have eternal salvation? No. God expects us to be continually obeying the things that he declares in his word. Over in 1 Timothy, chapter 4, down here in verse 16, he says, take heed unto thyself. And when it says take heed, again, everything that you see often is present tense. You just don't pick it up in the King James. Be continually taking heed. And this is an imperative mood. This is a command. This isn't a suggestion. God is commanding every one of us, hey, you need to continually be taking heed unto yourself. You've got to be taking heed so you don't let anything slip or you don't know, let the enemy come in. And also under the doctrine. So you've got to be looking out. You don't give place to the enemy yourself. And also to the teaching. 
You've got to be taking heed continually to the teaching, continuing in them. <clears throat> Continue obviously does imply that it's going to be a present tense, and this is also a command. Not only do you take heed to it, as it says, which means to hold on to it, give attention to it, but you also continue in it, ongoing action, otherwise, imperative mood again, a command. God commands you to continue in doing the Word. What's going to be so important? For in doing this, by doing the Word continuously, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That means it's going to produce the salvation of the Lord by you continually taking heed to the Word, doing what the Word, continuing the Word. It's an ongoing work. It'll produce the salvation in your life. And also it says, them that hear thee, and it's interesting here that this is also in the present tense, those who are hearing you on an ongoing basis. If someone will keep listening to it, you're trying to minister to, take, take and hold the Word and walking in it, great. They're going to see the salvation come into their life. If they shut you off and they won't listen to you, <coughs> is it going to produce the salvation of the Lord in them? Nope. It's not going to work. They need to be listening. Of course, you've got to have wisdom on how you're feeding the people with the Word of God. You don't cram a steak down a baby, you know. <laughs> you give them, a, give them milk, you know. He needs milk to start out. And you want to be sure, you know, you, you know, some people say you got born again and they want to talk to you about casting out the demons and all these things and destroying all the works of the enemy and all this stuff instantly. They may not be ready for that, you know. You got to be wise on how you're ministering to people. Let's get them born again. Let's get them receiving the Holy Spirit. Let's get them in the Word. Let's start teaching them who they are in Christ. Let's start giving them, you know, what they have need of and start showing them. And then you can, you know, we'll start, we'll take them into those things as we go. So you've got to have wisdom. Some people just, you know, you're just going to shut somebody off. They just can't handle it yet. So be wise in the way that you minister to people. We see back over there in that James 1 that we looked at before. Ongoing action, James 1.21, where it says to receive. Now this is not the word decam. This is the word decamai, not the word lombano. It's not talking about you taking hold of something. This is talking about you having a ready reception, a passive reception to what's coming to you. So as the Word's coming to you, like right now, you're to have a ready reception with meekness, you know, meekness, that gentleness, that meekness, which is a teachableness, receptiveness, ready to receive the implanted Word, this implanted Word coming into you. And what about this implanted Word? Which is able, has power to save your souls. Present tense, has continuously it has power that will produce the salvation of your soul. So as you hear the Word, and you're, of course, put in an operation, the Word in you is going to continually work to bring the salvation of your soul, delivering you, healing you, restoring you. That's why hearing the Word and continuing to hear the Word is so important. Yeah. It's doing a work in you. Keep hearing the Word. We see over in Luke chapter 13, verse 23, one said to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Again, does that mean that this, it's already an accomplished fact? No. They understood, if they translate it correctly, present tense, are there few that are being saved? That's the way, that's really what he said, literally. Not that are already saved, that are being saved. See, that's, they understand this mentality back then. We've missed the whole boat because the translations are wrong and the people haven't looked at it at all. He said to them, as he goes on, he says, strive. This word strive means to contend with adversaries and fight. Same word for fight, the good fight of faith. You are going to be contending with the adversary and fighting. And is this something that I just do for a moment? No, it's going to be an ongoing action. Present tense again. This is your life. You're going to be contending with the adversary, conquering him in your life. It is an imperative mood. When he's talking about the ones that are, you know, are being saved, this is the guy that is being saved. <laughs> the guy who is following the command. He is engaging in the warfare. He is fighting the good fight of faith. These guys are striving, as he says, or they are contending with adversaries and fighting to be able to enter in 
at the straight gate, which is the narrow gate, the narrow gate, the way that you and I are going to enter in. And he goes on and says, I say unto you, you'll, that many, many, I'll say unto you, will seek to enter, but will not be able. They won't be able. Why? Because they haven't been doing the first part. If you haven't been contending with the adversary, fighting the fight, and conquering the enemy, you aren't going to be able to enter. And when it says they won't be, be able to enter, because it's interesting, the word able, I put the cursor over the word able, and it means, it's the word iskoa, which means to be actually mighty and forceful that produces spiritual strength. Mighty, forceful strength in you. You need that. If you don't have that, can you overcome the enemy? No. He's going to come in and take the word out, and how do I get this way? Through the word in you and doing it. You have the spirit of might operating in you that you'll be able to conquer all your enemies. See, what happened to these guys that, you know, they obviously didn't enter in. Why? He said, I know you not whence you are. Oh, they're, they're, they must have fell by the wayside. These guys, they, they said, we've eaten drunk in thy presence, they're saying. You taught in our streets, so we heard your word. We were in the presence of God. Well, because you've been in the presence of God and heard the word, great, but that does not put in the guarantee that everything's right. No. He says, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Were they doing the word? No. They were workers of iniquity, which is what? Unrighteousness. They weren't doing the word. If you're not doing the word, you're doing something else. Anything that's apart from the word will be unrighteousness, and we're not going to see the salvation of the Lord. So he's saying, hey, are there, are there few that are being saved? So he says, hey, if, if you're contending with the adversary and you're fighting this good fight of faith and you're conquering and overcoming, which will be the result, so you can enter in and you're going to have the mighty power, mighty force to be able to do it because you're going to conquer the enemy, you're going to be there. All the rest of the guys that are walking in unrighteousness, they're going to be on the outside. They're going to hear, depart from me, because they did not do what was necessary. John chapter 3, over in John 3, verse 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. Now, that's interesting here. This also points out the condition, because this one here is a subjunctive mood meaning that they might be saved if they meet the conditions. Coming back to doing what God's Word says. You can't, it's not, we're, not, we're not calling the conditions. God's called the conditions. Everything He said in words, the conditions. If we don't come in line with His conditions, are we going to see the salvation of the Lord? No. Everybody wants to do it their own way. No, you're only going to get in if, you're, if you do it God's way. You have to meet His conditions if you're going to see things come to pass. Over in Luke, Chapter 8, which we were mentioning about how the enemy comes to try to take the word out of the person's heart. Here's the devil coming in Luke 8, 12. And taketh away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. Again, when we look here about the saved, this again is a subjunctive mood. That means it's conditional lest they might believe and might be saved. Or I think this believe, let's see what believe is. I forget what that one is. That's having believed. Lest they, having believed, might be saved. Well, that means just because you believed doesn't mean you are going to be saved. Having believed, they might be saved if they meet the conditions because if you really believe, you're going to do what the Word says, and you're going to do it continuously. You're not going to let the devil come, because the devil comes to take the Word out of the heart. How does he take the Word out of the heart? If we don't understand it, if we don't do it, do what he says. You get knowledge first, you do the Word, it produces spiritual understanding in your life. That's why doing the Word consistently is so important. We see another scripture showing these conditions about salvation, because salvation is an ongoing process and conditional as we're seeing in all that we're looking at tonight. Verse 34, But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say, that you might be saved. Yeah, does that mean it's going to automatically happen because I heard it? Nope. Subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood 
means it's expressing things that are contrary to a fact that are conditional upon conditions being met. So, if you, you might be saved if you respond to the things that I say, if you take hold of the word and do it. That's absolutely essential. In John chapter 12, verse 47. Come down here. He says, if any man hear my words and believe not, here it's talking about the guy who doesn't believe. And may not believe. Subjunctive. Doesn't, that's, that's what happens. I judge him not. He says, for I came not to judge the world, but what did he come to do? He came to save the world. That he, that he, uh, that he saved the world. Let's see what this one is. I'm trying to remember. <clears throat> it's also subjunctive. This was not a good translation here, because if it's to save, that would make you think it's an infinitive, right? but it's not. I came not to judge the world, but that, that I might save the world as Young's brings it out. Otherwise, what you do with the word is the key. You hear the word you believe, you're going to have to act on it, walk it out, and then it will produce the salvation of the Lord. It's not automatic. That, it might, that I might save the world. Otherwise, it's conditional based on what you and I do with the word. We see it over in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Again, that didn't mean the Gentiles automatically were going to be saved because they were going to hear the gospel. We see the same thing, subjunctive mood. A pen's conditional depend upon whether they're going to do what the word says or not. We see the same thing used time and time again. People just read and gloss over these things and think that just, the, well, it's, it was going to automatically happen for them. No. 2 Thessalonians 2.10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. This is talking about in the end when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the lawless one. And people, instead of taking hold of the word here, this looks like this is a, actually infinitive. This would be to be saved. Receive not the love of the truth, to be saved, the way you would translate this. So it shows you that the people who rejected the word, and what's going to happen to the fall away crowd? See, in Thess first Thess Second Thessalonians 2, if you don't remember what this is all about, it talks about that that day is going to come but first, before it comes, there's going to be a falling away first. Because judgment's going to come to the church first, before this man of perdition. And what is going to be revealed. And so what do we see down here in verse 10? They walked in the way of unrighteousness. They got deceived. See, sin will deceive you. Because they didn't receive the love of the truth to be saved. They didn't see it happen in their life. Again, that's why we've got to guard ourselves and not let the devil get the word out of our heart. We see another one, 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they, all, they may also obtain the salvation. That doesn't mean it's going to automatically happen, does it? Obtain, it's the word obtain here. It's subjunctive mood. Are we going to automatically do it? No. That they might obtain the salvation. Again, it all depends on what you do with the word, whether you're walking it out, whether you're carrying it out or not. We see another, and we've given this scripture before, talking about the man who had the uh, incestual relationship going on, and the Corinthian church wouldn't deal with it. And Paul came and judged the guy to deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. People read that and think, oh, man, this guy was going to get saved, I guess. No, you've got to understand what's being said here. When it talks about the saved, actually it's an aorist tense, which is past tense. It better be, it would be translated that the spirit might be saved. Subjunctive mood expresses things contrary to fact. What's that mean? It was conditional. This guy, it was going to be a condition of whether or not he got saved. What condition would it be? He'd have to repent from that ancestral relationship and get out of it, of course. Get right with God. And if he didn't get right with God, he would have been destroyed. We see also over in 
Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And we take the time to point all this out to you so you clearly understand salvation is a process and it is conditional. Acts 16 verse 30. He brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's not an infinitive. It better should have been translated, what must I do that I might be saved? Subjunctive mood. See, you miss that all, that I might be saved. Otherwise, there were conditions. And what it was the fact is he had to do something. He had to do what the Word says to see it come to pass. They said, of course, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a command. And thou shalt be saved. Otherwise, if they met the there was the condition, then they would see this work be accomplished in their life. We see the same thing over in a familiar scripture that people use often for leading someone to receive the Lord, uh, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, where it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, well, first of all, let's see if, what all this is saying. Shall confess. It would be better translated might. It's not really talking about a future tense thing. It's a, a subjunctive mood. If you might confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you might believe in your heart, those are the conditions, see? Again, subjunctive mood. The gods raise them dead, then thou shalt be saved. Otherwise, you've got to meet God's conditions, and this, then it will produce that. You shall be saved. That's right. For with the heart man is believing, when he talks about believeth, present tense, he just didn't believe for a moment, he believed continually, ongoing, under righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made, he's speaking this the confession here, continually unto salvation. Otherwise, it's ongoing action. It's not just one, once and then I go and change my tune and become something else. <laughs> Forget it. No. You've got to be on the mark, continually following the Lord. One other last scripture before we close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking here about an, an, obtaining, an obtaining of something, and when it's really, or this word also refers to like an acquiring, as Young's brings it out, to the obtaining or the acquiring of salvation. What does that mean? That shows you that it's something that we are working to obtain, not like I've already obtained it. To the obtaining of salvation, to the acquiring of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're going to obtain this and we're going to acquire it as we walk it out in line with the Word of God. So we've seen a lot of important scriptures. Just because a person is saved at one point, does that mean they're always going to be in that state? We'll be talking about that whole issue later. But I'll just give you one scripture that just destroys the one saved, always saved teaching. Jude 1, 5. I will therefore put in remembrance, though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Uh, they didn't continue, did they? What happened? They got destroyed. So, it's ongoing action. Salvation is conditional and ongoing action. As you believe the word, say, how, how, how's this to work in my life? Hear the word and do it. Incorporate it in your lifestyle. This is the way I walk. Resist all the devil's temptations. Don't let him take the word out. You continue in the word, do what he says, and that's the way it is. That's the way you approach the word of God. It's not just hear some things and play pick and choose with what I want to do or, or I don't really want to, I don't want to know much about that. I want to do what I want to do. No, get, get yourself out of it. Whatever you hear, you take hold of it, you do it, you put it in operation. It becomes your lifestyle. This is the way I live. And this is my now, my lifestyle of what I'm doing. That is going to produce the salvation of the Lord. The power of God will work mightily in you, and you will see God bring forth all of the great promises in your life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father.
I thank you and praise you for the word of God that reveals the truth that salvation is a process, ongoing action of what I do with the word. And it's also conditional. If I don't meet the conditions, I will not see it come to pass. I thank you, Lord, that I will walk in line with the word of God. I will hear the word. I will do the word. I will incorporate it into my lifestyle. This is the way I walk. And I will continue that way. And I will see the salvation of the Lord in every area of my life to bring forth health, deliverance, freedom, peace, victory, prosperity, blessings coming upon me, overtaking me in my life because I am a hearer and a doer of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you can see how important it is to be a doer of the Word. I mean, it's in the Bible, but boy, when we see all these scriptures, if we don't continue in something, just because we know it, so what? A lot of people know things, but they're not doing them. And they're not walking it out. And they wonder why nothing's coming to pass. If we don't do the Word, make it your lifestyle, you will not see things happen in your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. We understand clearly Salvation is a process. It is something we continue in walking in. It is conditional. We thank you that we're going to put the word first place, be a here and a doer of it, and it will bring forth much fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.